I'm going to start with a brief overview of the two new payment models, the patient-driven payment model and patient-driven groupings model, and then uh, just quickly touch on some of the work ABPA did in advocating in regards to these two new models. So first, beginning with the uh, SNF PDPM, uh, for background on the motiva motivation for development of this model, uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the Office of Inspector General, the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, and even the media and others identified issues with the current case mix model, the Resource Utilization Group's version 4, or RUG 4, primarily focusing on the fact that payments under the SNF PPS are based primarily on the amount of therapy provided to a patient. Consequently, in 2017, CMS put out a proposal for a new case mix methodology, termed the Resident Classification System. CMS solicited feedback, which ABTA provided both in meetings with CMS as well as through comments, and in the spring of 18, uh, CMS proposed a new case mix methodology for skilled nursing facilities and termed it the Patient Driven Payment Model, or PDPM. While RUG4 reduces everything about a patient to a single, uh, typically somewhat volume-driven case mix group, PDPM uh, focuses more on the unique individualized needs, characteristics, and goals of each patient in classifying them. CMS believes that PDPM, which goes into effect on October 1, 2019, represents an improvement over the RUG4 model because it improves in pay payment accuracy and appropriateness by focusing on the patient rather than the volume of services provided, it reduces administrative burden on providers, and it improves SNF payments without increasing total Medicare payments. So under PDPM, each patient is classified into a group uh, for each of the five case mix adjusted components based on data-driven patient characteristics. And so those components are physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech language pathology, non-therapy ancillary, and nursing. PDPM also includes a variable per diem adjustment that adjusts the per diem rate over the course of the stay, meaning that for the PT, OT, and non-therapy ancillary components, the case mix adjusted per diem rate is multiplied against the variable per diem adjustment factor following a schedule of adjustments for each day of the patient's stay. Now, I'm not going to go into specifics of PDPM, uh, but I will note that APTA, as well as several of our sections, are working on developing resources and more educational materials related to PDPM. And so please stay tuned for more webinars, Q&A sessions, and other tools and resources that we'll be rolling out in the coming weeks. Now, finally, I will also note that while PDPM includes uh, the policy changes to the SNF case mix system, uh, it also includes new MDS item sets, a limit on concurrent and group therapy, an interrupted stay policy, and more. Now, moving into uh, the home health patient-driven groupings model, for a little bit of background on what prompted development of this model, Again, I reference MedPAC, or the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, which had said for years that home health payments should not be based on the number of therapy visits. MedPAC felt that payments based on therapy thresholds created financial incentives that distract agencies from focusing on patient characteristics when setting plans of care, and home health payments should be determined by patient characteristics. As a result of multiple reports to Congress and MedPAC recommendations, CMS did consider development of a new payment model. And really, they re-examined some payment reform principles, um, improving payment accuracy for home health services, promoting fair compensation to home health agencies, and increasing the quality of care for beneficiaries. CMS put forth a proposed model termed the, termed the Home Health Groupings Model in 2017, but received significant pushback from the industry, including APTA and the other therapy groups, and ultimately, they delayed implementation. Then, in February of 2018, the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018 was signed into law, which instructed CMS to modify the home health case mix system, eliminate therapy thresholds, and base payment on 30-day periods instead of the current 60-day episode. The result, the patient-driven groupings model, which was proposed by CMS in July of 2018 and finalized by the agency in November last year. Again, APTA submitted comments. We met with the agency multiple times. We also worked with the home health section in drafting comments. And um, 
you know, we, it really resulted in some significant changes between the proposed and final rule. So PDGM is a new payment model for the home health prospective payment system that relies more heavily on clinical characteristics and other patient information to place home health periods of care into meaningful payment categories, while again, like I said, eliminating the use of therapy service thresholds. PDGM will take effect January 1, 2020, and as instructed by Congress in the Bipartisan Budget Act, there will be a change in the unit of home health payment from a 60-day episode to a 30-day period. So using 30-day periods as the basis for payment, this slide provides an overview of how 30-day periods are categorized into one of 432 case mix groups for the purposes of adjusting payment under PDGM. In particular, 30-day periods are placed into different subgroups for each of the following broad categories, admission source, community, or institution, timing of the 30-day period, early or late, clinical grouping, of which there are 12 subgroups and something that specifically ABTA continued to advocate on, functional impairment level, low, medium, or high impairment, and comorbidity adjustment, which is none, low, or high based on secondary diagnoses present. And again, in total, there are 432 case mix adjusted payment groups. Now that I've re briefly reviewed the basics of PDPM and PDGM, I wanted to quickly touch on a few key realities about these two models, rather than the myths such as those listed on the slide. And I encourage everyone on today's webinar to share the following three facts with your peers and colleagues. This is communicated by CMS through uh, their rulemaking, as well as via conference, call, conference calls and national calls with providers. And CMS also intends to reiterate these messages as they educate uh, SNF and home health stakeholders. But essentially, there's three key facts, three key takeaways. First, while the payment methodology is changing, coverage of physical therapy and other therapies in the SNF and home health setting are not. Coverage is not changing. Second, there are no changes to what clinicians must document to support why a patient is getting the services they need. And third, patient needs do not change as of October 1st or January 1st, 2020. And finally, it's important to note that CMS intends to hold providers accountable under these new models to ensure they're delivering the appropriate care. To do so, CMS will be analyzing claims data as well as MDS data and OASIS data for changes in utilization of services. CMS also will be monitoring for changes in scoring on quality measures, including readmissions, pressure ulcers, pain, and mortality. And like I said, CMS has also said in rulemaking that, of course, providers must continue to comply with the conditions of participation and the individual plan of care. And finally, on this slide, I just wanted to highlight a couple APTA resources both in regards to post acute care reform, which is a very comprehensive web page on all things happening post acute care, and then the new payment model web page, which focuses specifically on PDPM and PDGM. It will house all of these new resources and educational materials that I referenced earlier. It also links to all of the CMS resources. Uh, so it's a great landing page and home page if you're looking to get smart on one or both of these models. So with that, I will now turn it over to Alice. Thanks so much, Kara. Uh, I want to just talk a little bit about um, demonstrating value and how this might impact physical therapist services um, under these new payment arrangements. PDPM and PDGM represent one of, if not the most significant shift to value-based care delivery and payment for therapy services. This is a true move from volume driving reimbursement to a focus on the value contribution of rehabilitation therapies in the skilled nursing and home health settings. By identifying those patient characteristics most indicative of a need for and the potential meaningful benefit from therapy services and aligning payment with those characteristics, the focus is on matching patient need to service delivery and optimizing the opportunity for sustainable outcomes in this patient population. A successful transition to this value-based payment environment will require an adoption or expanded adoption of several practice components, and I just want to review those a little bit. Um, the first is the use, reporting, and analysis of quality measures throughout an episode of care. 
Reporting of quality measures is not a new concept in these settings. However, the use and real-time analysis of this information to drive practice and care decisions may be. Uh, determining how you will implement systems that provide continuous and real-time feedback to clinicians and interprofessional teams to ensure that the information is informing practice, reducing barriers to efficient care delivery, and promoting appropriate service and site of service utilization will be critical. Data-informed and data-driven practice will be based on more than the reported quality measures. Each organization will need to look at the data they're currently collecting and how that data serves to, serves to inform and drive practice. There may be information that you're collecting today that does not bring value moving forward and other information that you are not collecting that would serve providers and patients in a more meaningful way. If the information you are collecting is not being used to drive some operational or clinical process and or decision, you need to ask yourself why you're collecting it. And on the other hand, if you have clinical and or operational challenges that you have not found a solution to, it's important to determine what data you're missing to address those challenges. Effective clinical and operational performance is dependent upon a feedback loop and a process change model that is active, consistent, and systematic. In order to measure the effectiveness of care, you have to know what the care is. So dissemination and adoption of best practice models, clinical practice guidelines, and critical, and clinical protocols is a necessity in a value-based care environment. Our greatest threat is the vari variability in practice in our settings. Standardization will be critical, critical moving forward in order to compare providers within organizations and to compare organizations and settings overall. A performance-based payment system requires consistent performance and a means by which you measure that performance. Ultimately, our ability to assess and compare performance in a value-based care and payment environment requires us to eliminate unborn variability in practice. This means we need to challenge providers to adopt evidence-based practice models and identify and support de deviations from standards of care. Those deviations will occur um, with certain patients and certain patient populations, but identifying them and supporting why those deviations occur will help us to understand standard practice and how those practices might impact different outliers. PDPM and PDGM attempt to align specific patient characteristics with certain services or care models based on historic data. This concept of providing the right care to the right patient at the right time is one of the benchmarks of value-based care delivery. Appropriate utilization of personnel is also critical. Given that the skills of certain providers are going to be more closely aligned with patient need, the use of those resources will need to be responsible and appropriate. Determining what must be done by a therapist or a therapist assistant and ensuring that only those things that require the skills of a therapist or a therapist assistant are performed by those individuals will ensure responsible stewardship and optimal resource utilization under a payment system that's designed to minimize inappropriate utilization of high-cost resources. Top of life practice is just that, responsible stewardship of a resource. Carol, I'll turn it back over to you now. Thank you, Alice. So next, Bud Langham and I are going to talk a little bit about looking ahead to the future, the move towards unified post acute care payment system. Because of course, as we all know, the PDPM and PDGM are not here forever. This is really a transitional move towards the end goal of a unified post-acute care payment system. Now, before we get into that discussion, I do want to highlight uh, the, some advocacy opportunities that are available for uh, individuals to engage in this year. First, uh, we can expect to see the fiscal year 2020 skilled nursing facility payment rule released end of April, early May. And while we do not expect significant changes to PDPM, it's possible that CMS will make some tweaks to the model and we'll discuss them in the rule. And so, of course, APTA will be submitting comments 
Kara, we're going to stop right there. Uh, it seems like yeah. someone has logged on, and please be sure to mute your telephone and your uh, computer uh, microphone. Thank you. Continue, Kara. Thank you. Thank you. So like I said, ABTA will be submitting comments on that rule. We anticipate meeting with CMS uh, during the rulemaking period. And we also will be making available a template comment letter for both members and non-members to submit comments on the rule. In addition, uh, the home health rule we can expect to see released likely early July. And again, while we don't anticipate major changes to PDGM, it's possible that CMS will make minor tweaks or may discuss PDGM in the rule. And so, of course, ABTA will be reviewing the rule, uh, working with the home health section to review and analyze and uh, submit comments. And again, we will be making available a template letter for members and non-members to submit comments on the rule. And again, we do anticipate meeting with CMS to discuss what is included in that rule sometime during that rulemaking process. So moving ahead to the broader discussion of a unified post-acute care payment system. While the discussion thus far has really focused on the two new payment models for skilled nursing facilities and home health agencies, we do want to take a few minutes to also discuss the bigger picture, specifically in terms of what the future holds for post-acute care. Now, as you all probably know, the IMPACT Act of 2014 required MedPAC to develop a unified post-acute care payment system spanning the four post-acute care settings and required MedPAC to submit a report to Congress recommending features of a unified cross-setting PAC payment system. In its June 2016 report to Congress, MedPAC stated that a unified system is feasible and within reach, noting, however, that a unified system will need to embrace episode-based payments to focus providers on the care needs and outcomes of a patient throughout the episode of care and limiting incentives to deliver unnecessary care. The commission also noted in that initial report that as Medicare pays post-acute care providers under a single payment system, it would also need to give providers more flexibility to offer services that span the post-acute continuum of care. Such system also could consider standardizing cost sharing when beneficiaries use post-acute care services. And finally, MedPAC also noted in that report that a common core set of conditions of participation for all post-acute care providers and specific requirements for providers that opt to treat patients who require specialized resources would also be needed and taken into consideration. The following year, in June 2017, MedPAC issued another report to Congress noting that a post-acute care payment system would redistribute payments among types of stays and settings. Payments would decrease for rehab care unrelated to patient characteristics and increase for medically complex care. Now, the Impact Act does not require the implementation of a unified system by a certain date, but it did suggest that a unified post-acute care payment system would not be proposed before 2024 for implementation sometime later. But in that June 2017 report, MedPAC said it thought implementation of a unified system could begin as early as 2021 with a three-year transition. In that report, the Commission also recommended that Congress direct HHS to begin to align setting specific regulatory requirements, such as modifying the ERF 60% compliance threshold or the skilled nursing facility three-day stay requirement, as well as look at providing exceptions for providers that enter into alternative payment models and accept downside risk. MedPAC continues to work on a unified post-acute care payment system, considering refinements that would improve the design. I encourage everyone on today's webinar to review MedPAC's previous reports to Congress on this unified system and monitor future MedPAC discussions for what they recommend will have significant influence on what will eventually be proposed and consequently adopted. I'll now turn it over to Bud, who can also share some insight into MedPAC's efforts in this space. Bud? Thank you so much, Kara. And I just want to briefly say how um, appreciative I am for everything APTA and specifically Kara and the whole team really are doing in this space. There, the pace of change is accelerating so much, it's hard for any of us individually uh, or even collectively with our organizations to keep track um, of all of this change. And so uh, I, I just don't know where we would be without the APTA team. I did want to say specifically in the MedPAC conversation that it's, it's vitally important for all providers in all post-acute care settings to keep up with what MedPAC is saying. CMS doesn't always adhere to what they say, but they certainly do listen. And it would behoove all of us and our organizations and our individual settings to uh, 
contemporaneously understand what they're thinking, what they're putting out there, and what implications it might have on us, specifically um, related to their thoughts on rehabilitation. And they have been quite clear that they see an overutilization problem for rehabilitation services in the post-acute care space. So just want everyone to, to stay uh, dialed in on what MedPAC is, is putting out there. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about the panel, the technical expert panel that I was able to serve on along uh, with Heather Smith, the Director of Quality at APTA in late September 2018. It was, um, it was a very good experience. It was a day-long meeting where we, we went through a variety of issues related to a potential unified PAC PPS system. There were a number of settings there, including LTAC, inpatient rehab, home health, um, skilled nursing, all of those settings were present. Uh, there were a number of stakeholders as well. It was a day-long, really robust conversation related to data that uh, we have been asked not to share too much in the way of detail on, but it was a, a fantastic discussion to help understand and to guide what CMS uh, is really looking to do from the perspective of a unified PAC PPS system. Uh, during that day, there were a lot of things that came up that I think is um, fairly well known and in the MedPAC reports have been discussed um, pretty frequently. And so just a few of those topics that we need to all be thinking about, um, defining cost, not just benefit, beneficiary specific costs, but also setting specific costs. So if you're creating a unified PAC payment system, how does the cost in, um, intertwine with the reimbursement mechanism? And then how do you distinguish between uh, facilities that have much higher overhead costs and those uh, settings with less overhead costs like a home health agency? It was a, a pretty substantial topic of conversation. Of course, you have to think about quality assessments and quality measures. There was a lot of discussion around quality measures and how we would ensure quality of care is delivered uh, across the post-acute care continuum, and, and what did that really mean for assessments? The care tool, of course, has been out there for a while. I think we are all starting to see some of those items move into our assessment instruments, and so certainly as an industry and across all the settings, uh, we need to be intimately familiar with the cross-setting measures and cross-setting instruments such as the care tool. When you think about a unified PAC PBS system, there also has to be a discussion around regulatory uh, issues. So, for example, the three-day stay requirement for skilled nursing facilities, the three hours a day requirement for rehabilitation in an inpatient rehab hospital, and homebound status in the home health setting, just as a, as a few. In any unified post-acute care system, we're going to have to have a fresh perspective on regulations that need to stay and regulations that should be altered. And then, of course, data sharing. I think we're all seeing in each of our settings that interoperability and being able to share information about patient populations in real time is a tremendous struggle and a tremendous opportunity. These issues and many, many more have uh, been discussed uh, on the panel. Um, RTI CMS then sent some follow-up questions for the members of the TEP to review and comment on again, and they have signaled that there will be additional meetings to dig deeper into each of these topics. I think we have a, a really tremendous opportunity through uh, the power of the APTA to influence this process proactively to make sure that patients retain sufficient access to rehabilitation, not just PT, but also OT and SLP, that we uh, advocate for their right to access those services. And we on this call all certainly understand how rehabilitation done well drives high quality outcomes and patient satisfaction. So I think the opportunities for us are pretty substantial, and I'm, I'm very thankful to be able to participate in this TEP with Heather and uh, to continue to do so for the APTA.